be looking today at Romans chapter 5. Um, I'll read verses 12 through 14, get into some background information, develop it, and move on in. And uh, we'll be looking at chapter 5, verses 12 to the end of the chapter, verse 21. So beginning at verse 12, reading to verse 14, uh, Romans chapter 5. Paul writes, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. And so what we were looking at, and let me lay a foundation for you, is that Paul has been teaching on a doctrine. I've mentioned the doctrine many times. I'll use the name again. It's called the doctrine of justification, the doctrine of justification by faith. And he's already pointed out that justification is how God removes the penalty of sin. It's how God declares the sinner to be not guilty, to be totally forgiven. And we've seen how Paul outlined the fact that God does this by grace. He does it this way because no one deserves to be forgiven. According to Romans 3, we saw this at verse 24. He has said, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so God has justified the believer by his grace. Why? We don't deserve it. Now, he's already said, and I'll lay this as a foundation, that all humanity is guilty of sin both Jew and Gentile. In chapter 3, he had said at verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. In chapter 3, verse 23, he said, all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. In the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, it says, uh, there is no man who does not sin. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. In Galatians 3.22, Paul says the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so Paul has made it very clear. Everyone is guilty of sin. But now he begins to speak concerning how sin came into the world. Notice in verse 12 how he says it. In verse 12 he says, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned now notice i want you to see this he begins to speak very clearly concerning this and he says through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin so what he's referring to is the genesis account of the fall and he's saying through one man sin entered the world now i want you to see this he doesn't say sin originated with man he said that sin entered through man well if sin didn't originate with man then where did it originate the answer is it originated with satan in first john 3 verse 8 it says the devil has sinned from the beginning from his rebellion satan has been the originator as well as the initiator of sin and so through pride the bible teaches us satan fell from his position he was at one time referred to as the covering cherub. The cherubs, they have different, uh, and I'm not going to go into this hierarchy and all of that, but they have the cherubim, the seraphim, they have the angelicos. There's a variety of, of uh, rankings, if you will, and, and he was what is called the covering cherub. He was responsible, Satan was responsible for the protection, if you will, of the glory of God. And he was also referred to in Scripture as being the worship leader. He led the angels in songs of praise to God. But according to Ezekiel 28, 17, speaking to the enemy, he said, your heart became proud on account of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. And so the sin that got Satan kicked out of heaven sin of pride and so after his fall 
he actually influenced fellow angels to follow him in his rebellion. We see in the book of Revelation 12, verse 9, he's referred to in various ways in Scripture. He's called the great dragon. And there it says, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. His angels were cast out with him. Nobody knows exactly how many angels fell, but it's presented as a third of the stars of heaven. So it's a tremendous multitude. Now, after his fall, he entered into the Garden of Eden, and there he tempted Eve. Now, he had fallen by pride, and so he tempted Eve through pride to disobey God. In Genesis 3, 4 through 6, it says that the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So she gave it to her husband in the, in the Spanish translation, He's referred to as Menso. So anyway, <laughs> so anyway, just to see if you're here, that's, 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 that word was my nickname given to me by my mom and others. So anyway, Adam knowingly disobeyed, but Eve was deceived. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 13 and 14, Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. And so Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, but the sin is charged against Adam. Why is that? Well, because Adam had been given a direct order, a direct command by God. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that ye eat thereof you shall surely die. God had spoken directly to Adam, gave him direct orders. Adam knew that it was wrong. Eve was deceived by the cunning and craftiness of Satan, and therefore the sin was charged against Adam because he willfully did so. And so through his disobedience, sin enters into the beautiful and the perfect earth, and Adam sinned, and his once sinless nature is now fallen. So notice how it says sin entered the world, not sins, plural, not particular sinful actions, sin itself, the nature. It speaks of his nature, an inherent pros, uh, propensity to unrighteousness. Adam now has a sin nature, and it's that nature that his children inherit. We are all, as his offspring, we are all inheritors of his nature. The nature is trans, uh, transferred through the father. And so we have received Adam's nature. It's called in theology, it's referred to as the Adamic nature. He is what is called the federal head of humanity. He represents us all. And so Adam has a sin nature. It's that nature that we have inherited. So it says in verse 12, thus death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. So his descendants receive his fallen sinful nature. That's why Paul, when he was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 3, said that we were by nature children of wrath. The psalmist in Psalm 51, verse 5 said, Look, I was guilty of sin from birth, a sinner the moment my mother conceived me. In Psalm 58, 3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we by nature are sinners. We are doing that which is natural for us to do. We have the Adamic fallen nature. Now, God had told him in the day that he ate of this fruit that he would surely die. Spiritually, he immediately was cut off from God. But ultimately, and these are amongst the saddest words in Scripture, ultimately, he physically died. 
In Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, it says, All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Those words, and he died, were never supposed to be part of his, his story. He wasn't supposed to, but he chose to. He chose to take of that forbidden fruit. He knew it was wrong, and he did it anyway. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to why he did that. Many say that he would prefer have he would prefer being cut off from God than to be cut off from Eve. I don't know. All I know is he made a choice. And all I know is that we suffered as a result of that. I remember when I was about eight years old or so, first hearing about how Adam fell and passed on his nature to us. And I have to tell you the truth. I, was, I hated Adam. I, I did. Because even at, at that young age, I saw that the world was a mess. And that was a long time ago. How much more so now than then? And so as just a little guy, then I thought, and I really did. When, when the catechism teachers taught us about the Adamic nature and taught us how that Adam had taken of the fruit and had, and had fallen and my, my sinfulness is, is now as a result of him and, and the corruption in the world, the decay, the sorrow, the killings and all the disease, all of those things, I, I really did have a real problem with him for, for doing that. But that actually informs us as to why death, sickness, and evil do exist. You know, that's one of the questions people will ask. If God is good, how come there is evil? Well, <laughs> it exists because choices were made to disobey God. And there will always be a consequence. There will always be a result. And so because the choice was made to disobey evil and the things that pertain to it are the result Evil's the consequence of man's decisions. It's not the design of God. He didn't create Adam to fall. Well, it says in verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So obviously sin was in the world, even though Moses' law, that's what's being spoken of, the law of Moses, had yet to be given. And that's the reason people were dying, it's because of sin. You see, if there was no law forbidding sin, somebody would say, well, how could they be judged? There's no law that says they shouldn't sin. But guilt and sin didn't begin with the law. Guilt and sin actually predated the law of Moses. The fact that they died revealed that sin existed. And, and the penalty, the wages of sin is death, the penalty was experienced. And though there was no law of Moses yet, there was a conscience. And the conscience condemned them as violators. They didn't do the things that they desired to do, and thus they violated their own conscience, demonstrating they weren't perfect. And that made men accountable for their actions. In verse 14, going on, he says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit, they were evicted from the garden. Access, as we know, to the tree was blocked, so it's impossible to sin exactly as they had. But due to sinful human nature, we all die. Now notice in verse 14, Adam, who is a likeness, he speaks of him in that way, who is a likeness of him who was to come. That word likeness can be translated a type. Adam is a type of Christ. How is that? Well, his, his life and his death affected all humanity. In 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, it says, Since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So in Adam, all are sinners, he's saying by natural birth, but in Christ... All are made righteous by faith in him. So 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Jesus is called the life-giving spirit in that he imparts spiritual life to believers. Adam imparted sinful nature. Jesus imparts to us a new nature. Somebody said the first Adam became, by his disobedience, a mere living soul. And from him, we inherit that nature. The second Adam, by his obedience, that's Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. And from him, we inherit the spiritual nature in us. 
Jesus in John 5 said to us at verse 20, 21, Just as the Father raises the dead and gives, life, gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he wishes. So we, we receive life through Jesus Christ. Though Adam passed on his sinful nature that results in death, Jesus gave us a new nature and we have life because of him. So in verse 15, he said, The free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. God's grace abounds through Jesus. It's a free gift. And notice the free, free gift is not like the offense. Why? Because Adam's sin ruined mankind. Sin destroys. Every evil we see today entered the world because of sin. Look around the world today. You know, when I, we were in Israel and I was giving a, a study in what is called the Antonio Fortress. And I was sharing a little bit in that, in that this number of years ago, I was sharing in that particular site how that Pontius Pilate, when Jesus was standing before him, Jesus said that he, that, that he was the one who spoke the truth and, and that his followers would follow him because they too were followers of truth. You know, that's obviously a paraphrase. But Pilate said at that point, what is truth? And I was sharing there, and, and I, I was sharing how that, um, you know, and I don't know how I rolled over to this area, but I did, so I might as well do it tonight too. Uh, I, I said, you know, um, there, there are people who say, how come the United States is not seen in Scripture? And it's not. The greatest nation on the face of planet Earth, the United States, is not found in Scripture. How come? And so, seeing I don't know, let's just keep going. No, um, <laughs> why would that be? And I said, you know, there's a couple of reasons that are generally thrown out. One of the reasons is that because... When the rapture occurs, there are so many believers who are taken up that it reduces the, the um, moral might of the United States. You know, people think that the church is worthless, but it's not. The church is used by God as salt and light. We are what is used to, to keep the corruption from spreading and the darkness from from taking over. That's what the church does. That's why we speak the truth. That's why we do that. that. That's a fact. That's why we do that. You see, so we have a purpose. Jesus said, you are the salt. You are the light. You are the only salt. You are the only light. That's what he says in Matthew 5. And that's a fact. That's what we are. That's why we're here. And also, I was sharing. I said, you know, so there are those who say or believe that perhaps what will happen is because there is a great revival and many come to faith in Christ that when that, when that um, restraining um, that we are to the evil taken over, when that is, this restraint is taken, that that leaves the enemy freedom to destroy and corrupt the way that he wants to, and that's, that's one position people have. The other is that, that the corruption and evil take over the United States to such a degree, despite the church's presence, that ultimately we find ourselves reduced to a different status than we've held for the last many, many years. Now, I've, I said that 20-some years ago, easily. I never thought that I'd actually see the potential of that being more true. Because we are living in a crazy time where dark is light and light is dark, where sweet is sour and sour is sweet, where evil is good and good is evil. We're living in that day right now when you cannot, and I want to be careful how I say this because it doesn't come from an evil and loving heart. It's just true. When you, when you don't have the capacity to tell a, another person what a woman is, there's something very, very wrong. You know, I saw a debate. Some of you perhaps saw it, a portion of a debate between, well, Q&A really, where, where uh, an individual who refers to himself as a, a woman, a transgender, apparently, and, and was arguing that there are many, many 
many genders that the spectrum is wider than male and female, et cetera. You know the argument, you've heard it. But this guy who was saying that he's got his hair like a woman, dressed like a woman, tries to look like a woman and all of that. But the person he, he was speaking to uh, said to him, some of you have heard this, he said, you're a paramedic, and the guy's a paramedic. And he said, uh, because this guy is saying that, that, that a man can be a woman, he says, you're on call, somebody has abdominal pains, it's a man, it's a physical man, and he says, I think I'm having a miscarriage. He said, would you treat him as if he was having a miscarriage? Would you? And it, it, the guy had no answer for it. Why? Because of course he wouldn't, which kind of causes the argument to explode in your face. If, you know, I, I heard a man, and forgive me if it sounds coarse, I don't intend it to, but I heard a man say that when he has his period, it really, it really is difficult. And I'm looking at him, and I'm saying, my goodness. So this is where we've gotten. And so when you have a Supreme Court justice who cannot tell you what a woman is, when you have people in the highest echelons of, of American government, when you have, when you have, um, commercials that are, are intended to encourage young men and young women to join the armed forces, and they're making more of a concern about their personal pronouns than being the finest fighting force in the face of the world. They're more concerned with having uh, electric-powered tanks, which makes absolute, absolutely no sense at all. And yet you have people promoting that and arguing <coughs> I hate to say it, but what I was saying 20-some years ago seems to be more true now than ever before, where, you know, I used to tease and say, you know, I can stand up here and say I'm a six-foot-five blue-eyed Swede, and you guys would see me as being kind of like, okay, um, <laughs> but that's not true anymore, because you don't have the right to tell me that I can't believe myself to be that anymore. Now, what kind of world is that? We're living in a world where wrong is right and right is wrong. It's what Isaiah prophesied. It's what Isaiah spoke about. And so that's why the gospel is so important, guys. Don't give in. Don't give in to the course of this age. Don't go in. Don't go with the flow. Any dead fish can you know, float downstream. It takes a living one to go against it. And because the Holy Spirit has given to us the truth, speak the truth. Speak it in love, and, and do not be surprised when people get offended. They don't want to hear it, but it's still the truth. So getting back to what I should be teaching, <laughs> we're talking about the gift of God. Uh, the free gift, verse 15, is not like the offense because Adam's sin ruined mankind. And so in verse 15, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace came through that one man. So God's grace abounds through Jesus Christ who overcame death and gave life to us. You see, God gives us what is called the gift, the gift of eternal life. Uh, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. The gift to God is eternal life. And so this gift uh, through grace comes to us, this gift of life. In verse 16, he says, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. So he's contrasting and continuing to contrast Jesus and Adam. He, he speaks of the gift of life, and he speaks of the offense that resulted in death. So judgment, he's saying, came through Adam, and the result was condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses actually resulted in justification, so through Christ's atoning death, people are justified. We cannot justify ourselves. We need someone who is greater than ourselves to be able to do that. We sin. He never did. So we look to the one who never sinned, and he's the one who's able to justify us. And we trust that he did, and that what, that's what it means, that we gave our faith to him. And it's a free gift. Why? Because God's grace is free, and we receive life in him. And we can have fellowship with God and fellowship with God is to know God. This is eternal life, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John 17, 3. 
So it's a relational kind of thing that we have with God through Christ. So again, in verse 17, he says, if by one man's offense, death reigned uh, through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and, and, the, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Reign in life. And so death reigned from Adam, obviously. It's a sure thing for everyone who's been born. In Genesis 3.19, it says, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men to die once and after this the judgment. Death came, it came through Adam, but life came through Jesus Christ. And the grace revealed by the gospel exceeds the severity of the judgment for sin. And those who have trusted Jesus receive tremendous blessings in him. We've received an abundance of grace, he says. We've received the gift of righteousness. We've received his Holy Spirit. We've received his imputed righteousness. And, and we have eternal life. Eternal life, by the way, is, is, not, is not a length of days. Eternal life is a quality. The quality of life that we have. I mean, could you imagine if you just existed forever, how bored you'd get? Do you ever get bored? I get bored all the time. You know, can, could you imagine if, if eternal life was simply length of days? I get bored with it. I, 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 I just, I would be, yeah, if Marie's with me, she'd be bummed out every day forever, you know. <laughs> It's not, it's not just length of days, it's quality of days. It's a quality. And, and I, I gave up a long time ago, by the way, trying to imagine what that would be like. I can't, I don't have the imagination, I don't have the capacity, my eye hasn't seen, I, 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 my, eye, my eye hasn't seen, my, my, it hasn't entered into my heart the things that are prepared for me. I know that they're revealed, but even so, I don't have the capacity to really consider what that means. Like, all I know is it's, it's going to be an eternal now, and it's going to be joy unspeakable forever. Forever. Again, I, I, I'm trying to find words to impress you, but I can't. <laughs> it's just beyond me. All I know is this, that it comes from a, a knowledge of God and it comes through the grace of God. All I know is that I ultimately will see the one who died for me face to face, but not only will I see him, but I, have, I will see others whom I never knew by name, but by then, I, at that time, I will know even as I'm known. I just, you're not going to be wearing name badges in heaven, you know, and, and church affiliation, you know. <laughs> Hi, I'm David. You know, Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley is, is not going to happen. <laughs> But it's going to be amazing and all, and that's what I, I, I'm not even going to try. It's just a beautiful thing to know that. So we have this in, in him. Now, the gift of righteousness, he says in verse 17, is going to reign in life. According to John 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So forever we will have joy in heaven. Forever we enjoy triumph over the enemy. Revelation 3.21 says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Revelation 5.10, it says, and has, has made us into, uh, unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Revelation 20 verse six, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 22, 5, there shall be no night there. They will need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Well, in verse 18, therefore, as as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, 
the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because of Adam, he's saying, all humanity received the death penalty. But the free gift of eternal life is available to all who receive Jesus Christ. All who receive him. It's there. It's free. It's just for the taking. It's just saying, God, I genuinely, sincerely repent. I, I know I've sinned against you, and I ask for your forgiveness. I'm aware of that. I'm aware that, that, that if I stand before you right now, I, I'm aware that the only thing you could actually say to me would be that I am condemned forever. That's why I need you. Uh, I need you. That's why Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, that verse is so powerful to me. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly. The self-description of Christ. But the invitation comes. Come unto me. Are you, are, you, are you weary? Yes. Are you heavy laden? Absolutely. Then come to me. Then come to me. And I'm going to take the burden from you. And I'm going to give you freedom. Why wouldn't I do that? What's better than that? It's a free gift. In Revelation 22, 17, it says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who is thirsty come. And, and whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Well, he said in verse 20 that the law entered that the offense might abound. The law revealed... Um, what conscious, conscious sin is. We, we determined and did. It, it reveals that. The sins that we perform that, that can be seen. And, and the law actually served to name and reveal acts that were condemned by God. Later on, Paul is going to say that. He's going to say, I didn't know this was a sin until the law named it. And when the law named it for me, then I found myself guilty of it. I didn't know what it was like to covet, but then it said, thou shalt not covet, and I discovered that I'm a, a person filled with covetousness. Until that time, there was something wrong. I just didn't name it. I didn't know it was wrong. But when the law came, it told me what was wrong, and now I'm guilty. So the things that I was doing, these are the things that I, I now understand to be sin. Do you remember the first sin that you ever performed that you know? You know, some people do. I, do. I know the first sin that I ever did. I know it. I remember it. I've said it before. I stole bird seed. I was four years old, five years old. And I stole a can of bird seed. The can was green. The bird was yellow. And I wanted it. And I put it in my pocket. And I took it home. I stole it. I didn't have a bird. But I liked the can. <laughs> and my mother found it. Because when you're a stupid thief, you don't know how to hide your tracks. And so what happened is my mom found it and marched me back to the store in Norwalk. I don't know if I have any, anybody who's familiar with Norwalk, but there used to be a store called Shopper's Market. And we used to have what was called Billy's Market, which was a house. They used to have houses you'd go and buy but they built this supermarket. It was called Shopper's Market. It was, it was so amazing. We went to it on my, uh, in kindergarten as a field trip. Picture that, going to a supermarket. That's how backwards I am. What do you want to do? Let's go to the supermarket. And that's what we did when I was five. But they shouldn't have put that beautiful can where it was. And my mom marched me back. I had to hand it to the manager. And I had to say, I stole this. Frankly, I didn't even know what stealing was. I got pretty good later on. Because if you practice, you can get good. 
But see, I did something with no name. I didn't know what that was until they said that is called stealing. And so the law tells you what you're doing and tells you this is what it is. So you're a thief. Thou shalt not steal. And that's how it worked. And so there was sin, but yet unnamed. The law came to identify it, and sin abounded. But even as sin abounded, he says in verse 20, grace overwhelmingly abounded through Christ. Sin is terrible, but God's grace is super abounding is the point he's making. The gospel triumphs over sin. Why? Because it reveals God's amazing grace. In 2 Timothy 1.9, he saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but by his own purpose and by the grace he granted us in Christ Jesus before time began. You have the law and you have guilt, but you have God's grace and you have forgiveness. And so through Adam's sin entered, but through Jesus, God's grace was manifest. And he's building a case here about how powerful the grace of God is. And so, yes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, through his grace, has provided salvation. We're going to look at that more as we continue on into chapter 6, but we'll stop here.